This is the spiny forest of Madagascar, and um, it turns out that South Florida's climate is uh, because we have, we're, we're hot in the summer, hot in, which includes spring and fall for the north, and you know, we're, and, and rainy, and so our summers are rainy. And uh, Madagascar, in those areas that are deserts, also have summer rain, as does East Africa. So it turns out that, you know, we, Madagascar plants really like it here, most of them. And lucky, they lucky. Thrive. Yeah. Because yeah, they got such unique plants, a lot of endemic plants, right? Absolutely. And, and some of the most alien looking plants, that, you know, the most unique looking. In fact, there's only really three, three places, all islands in the world, that have a flora that really looks pretty alien on average. Madagascar being one, and, and Socotra, also in the Indian Ocean, is another, and then New Caledonia in the Pacific. And uh, we can do pretty well with uh, all of those, so it's well, pretty exciting. Well, take us to your little Madagascar island over sure. here. One of the um, features of Madagascar that I've become most interested in um, is I like the, the neglected parts of, of different floras. And one of them is the, is the euphorbias that, that are trees that look like coral. They call them coralliform euphorbias. And they're, what are most popular for growing in pots are usually the small spiny euphorbias with leaves, which Madagascar has abundantly. But since we can grow them outdoors here, the, the ones that look like coral have been of a special interest, so I've oh. been... Uh, when I think of the eu Euphorbaceae, that, that whole family, it is so diverse. It's incredible. It's one of the most diverse in terms of shape, probably of any genus. I mean, I don't know of any other genus that would be, and the, and the family is even more so, but um, it's remarkable because we can have everything from really small spiny uh, ones, which we'll see on the other end of the bed, to these, uh, which are my favorites, that are the ones that look like they are, from, they are coral, and they are very much focused on Madagascar. There's only a handful of these that really grow outside of Madagascar, so it's, um, this is Euphorbia feherinensis, which is two different uh, clones, which are somewhat different, this one, has a little more gold on the tips. It looks and, a little bit more glaucous too. And more glaucous and a little uh, kind of less spreading branches. And, uh, and these grow in south, southeast Madagascar. And Ooh, the, they feel weird, like a little rubbery or like, like Gumby. Like if Gumby were to come to life, this is what he would feel like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do have that, a very rubber. They don't tend to become super woody. They tend to kind of, and their, and their stems are full of a lot of latex and fibers, and so they do have a very kind of flexible, rubbery feel. And, be, and they, shed, they, do, they do have leaves, even though they don't look like it, but the leaves are very, very tiny, and they tend to be shed very early. So their whole appeal and whole structure is based on stems, as in, you know, this happens with a lot of plants in deserts, is that leaves are... They're very efficient at gathering sunlight and, and doing photosynthesis, but they also have a lot of surface area to volume, so it means that they lose moisture very quickly. And uh, stems being, being generally in cylinders tend to be more efficient at conserving water, and so they, and stems can also have chlorophyll and photosynthesize like leaves so that plants like this conserve water by dropping their leaves very quickly and then just using their stems to do all those jobs. The euphorbias that, that, do, that have these cylindrical stems and drop their leaves are what are the coralliform ones. And the ones that are coralliform and look like trees are almost exclusive to Madagascar. There's one, one of the other species that does it is on Socotra, Euphorbia arbuscula, and then the, the only other ones are the, the common uh, fire sticks, the Euphorbia tirocali, which is on mainland Africa. They usually lose their leaves, like the le leaves, because they grow leaves, but you don't always see them all the time. They only see them usually on the new growth and when they're really in lush, full growth, and then and then they drop them, and then and then those are also a coralliform euphorbia, and then one on the in the Canary Islands, Canary Islands that are called it's called Euphorbia aphylla, which means no leaves. So, mm. and so, but Madagascar by far has the most diversity, and this is one example, and then there's another example of the, of the great Madagascan 
prowliforms. That's like a stenoclata or a something. A super spiky one, yep. This yeah. is stenoclata here, and which is uh, this one that where the, the branches, the side branches end in a spike on this one, which gives it more of a, almost like a cactus appearance. But it's a euphorbia. And, and oftentimes, like in the common name, like the Tiracolia is also sometimes called pencil stick cactus, even though that's a misnomer. Absolutely, yeah. And cacti are only found in the New World, in the Americas. When those of us who are familiar with, with what's the kind of the common succulents in our part of the world, it's very common to use the common names of, uh, you know, associate them. Just like in Australia, a lot of things are called pines or oaks or even though those don't live there. But Morphologically speaking, though, um, you know, in a cactus is the... Oh, I got some of that. I'm not going to put that on my eye. <laughs> Morphologically speaking, the spine of a cactus is its modified leaf. Is that correct? That's correct, yep. And so these are, wouldn't necessarily be considered spines, but this would be part of their stem. Right. If you were to put them in that classification, they'd be a thorn, which is a modified branch or a modified stem. These really aren't very specialized. They're kind of just a, because they're, they're fairly similar. They're basically the, like a, just like a normal stem, except having the little tip. Got it. Little spiky tip. So they aren't really even as specialized as a thorn. Um, but they are, it's all, once again, it's all branch. The architecture of it is all stem. And it's very hard to even catch the little tiny, tiny leaves before they are shed. A really this, cool growth structure here. It's got fantastic structure, and it's uh, this one's kind of leaning on its side. It was grown from a cutting, so it was a bit unstable, and so we just let it lean, and we'll and now we'll grow up upright gradually. But that sometimes may, th these don't fare very well in high winds when we have hurricanes. So letting it lie on its side is a way to give it a little more stability for that those situations. Does anybody ever come here to prune these? Yeah, we do uh, keep what, them pruned and propagate them. You what know, are the precautions when you're coming in and pruning some of these euphorbia? Well, euphorbia are famous for their latex or their, their white milky sap that actually is uh, irritating if it gets, especially on your mucous membranes. Some people are sensitive to it just getting on their skin, period, but um, I've never had any reaction to that. But you definitely don't want to rub it in your eye. You know, it can cause a lot of irritation or or put it in your mouth, but um, mm -hmm. as long as you rinse it off with just regular water, I've found that to be quite effective. And, and, uh, this is probably one of my, my favorites, actually. Yeah, this is Euphorbia enterophora, subspecies crossa, which may be just called Euphorbia crossa now. And, oh, uh, really? That's interesting. But didn't it used to be called even platyclata at some point? I don't remember. But there's a it's xylophylloides. Its name. Yes, yeah. yes, that's what it was. Yeah. And uh, this one is is sort of a special version that gets those red tips with the little. I've hair. never seen the red tip. That's pretty cool. But now is classified as a separate species by some, and, and you can see this with this new growth. You can actually see the oh, leaves. Oh yeah! Look at that. Can you show that again? Shed. Absolutely, yeah. These are the actual leaves, which are very tiny and fairly quickly shed. You can see that right at the tip is where the, where the stem's ex extending. They've got the leaves, and then just a few leaves down, they're starting to be shed. And also, when it gets drier, they tend to shed more of the leaves. They don't hold on to them if there's any stress, but, you know, we've had a fairly rainy winter here, so they're happily growing. But this one is known for having flattened stems, which most of the coralliforms have more cylindrical stems. Mm -hmm. And we're growing a number of different versions here. This one's got a little more of orangey tomentum and little darker leaves. Yeah, much darker. And once again, this is a group kind of that it, once, once you see different collections from different parts of Madagascar, you know, start to notice the differences. You know that we like to classify plants into species and, and different hierarchies. But nature, you know, there's a whole, there's all this diversity and the plants don't know, you know, don't know what names we put on them. So there's, 
the level of diversity we think is important isn't necessarily the level of diversity that nature thinks is important. So it's uh, that's exciting and an exciting part of horticulture is we can explore that and appreciate that. Um, all the different ornamental possibilities of slightly different plants with different colors. And that's one of the interesting things about Madagascar. You'll see a lot of plants that look like things that you're used to in the, in the North American deserts, but they're generally not in, in very different plant families, and they uh, are adapting to similar stresses. As the aloes, you can see, look a lot like the agaves. The yes, they look way more like an agave than an aloe. But you won't see any, uh, there are no agaves in Madagascar. No, I was going to say, this, is not, not, <laughs> this, is, this would be a North American plant, wouldn't it? It would, yeah. And then the Kalankoe with their candle-like yeah. flowers. Nice Kalankoe flowers are often underappreciated yeah. how spectacular they can be. It looks like the, the common pencil stick. Yeah, you know? it does, and but it, what is it? Is it not? But it's actually not. It's actually wow. a, a relative of it in the same general group of, of these coralliforms from the far north of Madagascar. And it's got a very long name. It's Euphorbia, Euphorbia analalavensis from and it actually produces a quite different form architecture than, than the, the normal pencil stick, which tends to have fairly large central stems and shorter side branches. And uh, this, this, looks, this looks like a shrub. Yeah, and this one forms a shrub, and this is uh, almost 20 years old now. Wow, look how woody it actually gets in there. Is that like its base? That's it its base, that's wow. its trunk. Wow. And this was collected from the far north of Madagascar where it was really dwarfed and growing on limestone and had really swollen little segments and it looked like a totally different plant. And the Huntington Botanic Garden distributed it as part of their uh, International Succulent Introductions uh, program. And we just uh, figured out last year the actual scientific name. They thought it was uh, maybe a new species, but it turns out it's this uh, species that looks a lot like you know, the pencil cactus, but is uh, actually, well, one of the differences is the leaves are much smaller and shorter. The pencil cactus tends to have, when, they're, when the leaves are actually visible, much larger and they're a different shape. And when, the, when this flowers, it's quite different as well. Oh, so, I was gonna say, yeah. So one of the oftentimes plants look, look very similar when they don't have flowers and then when they flower, you realize, oh, this isn't, doesn't have any relation to that. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. That would have been, that's one that would stump me. Because, you know, when you see a little pencil stick cactus, you don't know what that's going to look like when it's really big and bulky. It could, it, you could very well turn into this. You don't know. Absolutely. Thank and you for pointing a... out those differences. And the other interesting thing about these uh, coralliforms is that they, they are all come in separate male and female plants so that, um, you know, in order to have to have seedlings, you know, you need both. So in many cases, they're propagated by cuttings because many of them are fairly easy by, from cuttings, so not all of them. So uh, we recently, this one is a male, and so it's never made any seedlings, but we recently went uh, to the Huntington Botanic Garden and got cuttings of all their, all their clones from this collection from about 20 years ago, and we have some females now. So ding, 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 we'll ding, be ding. able to, to make baby <laughs> before beyond the Lollavensis. So the normal pencil cactus is from mainland Africa, Euphorbia tirocali, but then there, there is a close relative of it that was for a long time called Euphorbia laro that's in Madagascar. And it's now uh, considered the same thing as, as Euphorbia tirocali, but we've noticed it has quite an, an interesting difference. Uh, it tends to have more of a it kind of tends to be smaller and have different branching architecture. And we've noticed some of the ones we have actually are much more cold sensitive than Tirocali because we just had a, an unusual period of time in the, where it was the temperatures were in the 40s, for upper 40s for several days, or around 50, which is really cold for South Florida. And some of these actually got damaged, which Euphorbia Tirocali would never. So we're, 
thinking. Do these redden up as well, like Tiracoli, or not so much? These do, these do redden up uh, sometimes, but in a different way. They get more of a dark kind of ochre. They don't get kind of the bright red. And, and only the, uh, the fire sticks version of Tiracoli tends to, to get that really bright color. Oh, interesting, okay. The normal, the, the more typical forms will stay completely green in full sun. Hmm. So um, we're busy exploring all the variations of, of Tiracoli because it's such a wonderful plant in terms of being able to tolerate, you know, droughts. It can even tolerate low lights. It can tolerate, and it's very easy to propagate from cuttings. So uh, I think they've got a lot of, a lot of potential to explore. Is and this, this, a, this one smells nice. I just rubbed against it. I don't know if it's that one Ooh. that smells nice or what. I hadn't noticed that being. Did it? I got something. I rubbed smell. against something. I don't know. Oh, yeah, this does have some. It's like a piney. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. does have a nice, nice uh, piney. This is a. Is it a bursia or something? Or? No, it's. Um, this is what it's to carry it. I forget this name. Which, it definitely it's smells great like it to has be like in a the, uh, piney. Be able in to it. cheat in botanic gardens. And, <sighs> so, yeah, a percolacaria, to carry it. Okay, not like carry a percolacaria. <laughs> The elephant yeah, 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 bush or something. Which is, I can't remember the family this is in. Let me check it. Yeah, tell us about this one. This one's like a sub-canopy tree. Yeah, this shows the, the actual tree form that a lot of these will eventually create, these coralliforms. This one can get, uh, could get 10, 15 feet tall eventually. And uh, it's Euphorbia campanii, which is uh, even for such a big, a big uh, tree, it actually was only described fairly, fairly recently, about 1995, and it was named after a Thai horticulturist, Kampan Tan Sacho, who founded the Nong Nuuk Botanic Garden, who funded some important work in Madagascar. And, um, and he's quite the character. He is indeed, yes. <laughs> if you he's watched any of our Thai videos, you will have seen him. <laughs> incredibly enthusiastic yeah. about uh, the plant world, and so this is named after him, and, it, and it's a spectacular uh, tree from south, southwest Madagascar that wasn't recognized as a, as a different species until, you know, about 1995. So, you know, there are still trees to be discovered in the world, and that's pretty exciting. And it's got these, the very golden hairs on the, on the new growth, and then it, it fades to a, a nice glaucous silvery color down, down beneath. And this is one's in active growth, so it's got some of the leaves showing at the right on the new growth that are quickly shed. And this is an interesting contrast. The Euphorbia analolavensis we just saw in the Euphorbia laro or Tirocali, they tend to keep most of their branches or all their branches, and so they form. They tend to form a big ball of, of branches. Whereas this is one of the species that sheds its branches, the lower branches, so it forms more of an open trunk. And you can see the, uh, almost like a skeleton down below mm. the bones of the old branches. And so sometimes when people are growing these, they get worried that they see the branches starting to dry up and fall off, but that's part of the architecture of this plant. Mm. It will shed them and so you, you end up without branches going back to the trunk. You end up with just sort of most of the branches being on the outside and a, and a nice trunk. And so this was never pruned. Wow, it pruned this itself. Just, uh, pr yep, and they it's do call it self-pruning, yep. What a, what a wonderful selling point in the horticultural market. Absolutely. Self-pruning tree. <laughs> <laughs> Though it does, it does uh, come with a, with a horticultural downside, unfortunately, because it seems that these self-pruning coralliform euphorbias Mo many times the cuttings you take will, will feel like they're being self-pruned and they shrivel up after you take. So we've noticed it's harder to, uh, to get the cuttings to root successfully. Interesting, even do you try to cut it on one of the green parts or can you actually take some of the woody bits? It seems that the new growth works better because okay. it's far farther away from being shed, maybe. It's, one of the, it's just a theory, but <laughs> it uh, hasn't been tested scientifically at all. But the other thing that larger cuttings seem to work better, which also kind of fits with the idea that the larger branches are less likely to be shed. And, uh, and what, what type of um, substrate would you root this in? Is it a bunch of perlite? Would you do sand? How, how do you guys do it here? We usually do it with perlite, because uh, that's, I mean, if we had other 
some other substrate. I also will do it with uh, what's called the stuff that's called turface or or various yep. other related the the very the called calcine clay that or clay well, that's like heated. the bonsai mix that you would normally find it in. Yeah. Absolutely, and and the various other specialized bonsai soils that are like that would probably work well. They're nice. very and can, but these you know as long as it's well drained, they don't seem to be too particular. But uh, though, kind of we you know we assume people often assume that they all will root as easily as Euphorbia tirocoli, but that's not at all the case, unfortunately. The Euphorbia tirocoli is kind of more an exception for how easy it is to root and, and to form a new Really good plant, tips so. for all those who care to venture into euphorbia propagation. It's a very interesting world, but it's a nice world that where you don't have to worry about adding humidity and, and other things that we often have to do with uh, our more humid and wet tropical plants. Exactly. And just like, you know, a lot of our cacti can actually go down to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius. What do you think is the minimum for some of these guys? I know you said some are more cold tolerant than others, but what is the general minimum? These seem to be, I mean, we haven't really, in South Florida, we haven't gone below 40 in the last, in the last I guess, 13 years, since about 2010, 12, 13 years. And below 40s, for a short period of time haven't hurt these noticeably. A little bit of damage on the, on the Madagascan Euphorbia tirocoli, Euphorbia laro, but this, we just had kind of a, not an extreme cold, but we had a period where it was stayed in the upper 40s for a very long time, for three or four days, and, and in the low 50s sometimes. And this actually has a little bit of damage from that. You can see these little, uh, little kind of dry spots mm -hmm. in the upper parts. And, uh, and that's definitely from this cold snap. And that's what, what cold damage looks on these. So, so it, it's both, it's not just a matter of the, the lowness of the temperature, but how long it, it, it persists. Good point. Thank you. This is the one that, that was called, or I guess it's still called Euphorbia xylophylloides. Oh, is it still called that? Okay. Or, uh, well, not official, I guess it's been subsumed in Euphorbia enterophora. Yeah, enterophora, okay. And, uh, but this, but it's definitely different in its appearance. It's kind of flatter and yeah. uh, this part's kind of, I think this branch is broken, it's kind of drying out, but the other part Some of this of looks like it's suffering, but this is the part that's in yeah. fresh growth. But this, yeah, this is, uh, Euphorbia is often called xylophylloides, though it's now been uh, synonymized with enterophora, but it's, it's got thinner stem segments and flat like the other one, and um, definitely different in, in terms of its horticultural characteristics. So I tend to use the, the old name. Mm -hmm. And this one does look like it's gotten some cold damage. These uh, lesions here look mm -hmm. like cold damage, so. Uh, There's one right by your foot. Yes, indeed. This is this one actually got a little more cold damage, unfortunately. This this drying off part. But this is um, another another clone of the Madagascar uh, Euphorbia laro or Euphorbia tirocoli. Oh, that's from it. Yeah, it looks different as a tiny guy, huh? And it looks different, and and also there's a lot of architectural variation in the Madagascar tirocolis. Uh, and I've we've got one one more we'll look at in just a moment. But this one tends to be much more open. The one we were just looking mm -hmm. at behind us is much more densely branched. And um, I'm curious to see what kind of interesting variations we can find and then breed them together. And some of these look quite good, even at a small size, have nice architecture. So I think they'd make really good pot plants, mm -hmm. whereas the normal pencil cactus tends to get fairly unruly in a pot. And, um, and the other, um, Interesting thing about these is that because they are uh, what's called dioecious, meaning they have separate male and female, that if you're growing several species together, they tend to hybridize. And we actually have had the, that happen spontaneously here. See, some of these are, uh, are actually volunteer seedlings. Mm -hmm. And um, and see some, and then some of them are flatter. Some oh, of them yeah, are more cylindrical. Some of them are cylindrical, yeah. <laughs> and because we only have one gender, you know, when you have only one individual, you only have one gender of these. And um, beggars and so can't this, be choosers, you know. Yep, this is true. <laughs> and the, and we used to have um, some big mainland Euphorbia tirocolis here that were hybridizing with these. So we've got all kinds of interesting uh, 
hybrids. Wow. Not, you know, kind of spontaneous hybrids. And, and like this is another one that looks more like Tiracali, but you see with flattening, mm -hmm. clearly has some of that Xylophyllodes or yeah, Enterophora. Pretty into, cool. You know. Hybrids, the hybrids look neat. So there's all kinds. So, so far, uh, I don't know of, of anyone making deliberate hybrids of these, but uh, there's a whole range of exciting possibilities for doing that. Well, you know, you have plant sales here, so you could be the, the starters, although you won't be able to really know, understand the provenance, but you could at least like say, <laughs> say this is a euphorbia hybrid of some sorts. Absolutely, yeah, we've always got to be, keep track of what's a hybrid and what's, uh, what's a species, that's for sure. Now, this is Euphorbia aluwadii, subspecies aluwadii, and uh, it's been called for many years Euphorbia leucodendron, and it's another Madagascan uh, coralliform. It forms a, a, a small kind of a small tree that uh, has these little leaves at the tip on the new growth, and then when the leaves are shed, you see these little dark kind of scars where the yeah. leaves were, and that's. That's something that's a little unique about this species that you don't see so much in the other coralliforms. And this one's also very easy to propagate and doesn't tend to shed its branches. So it fits that, that theory of which, which are easier to propagate. And, and this is one that's, that's not uncommon in horticulture because it is fairly easy to propagate and grow, but um, it's much slower growing than Euphorbia tirocali. And it's rare to see it growing into a nice tree form it takes a, it takes tends to take a while and uh, and look how bright green that new growth is and then how like verdigious glaucus this one is below and it's a great pot plant because it can make this nice form and you know as a very as a fairly small plant so with enough patience you know this has taken a few years to get to this point and awesome. really makes a nice specimen yeah. what's this Oops. one chad this is Euphorbia arbuscula from the island of Socotra. So the other plants we looked at, the other Corelliform Euphorbias are all from Madagascar. But this was the one that really got me interested in this aesthetic, this group of Euphorbias, because um, I, I just love symmetrical plants that are very, you know, architectural plants and plants that, you know, have really neat stem structure. And this one is, uh, has these beautiful silvery stems and the new growth is kind of, kind of the brown hairs on it that looks really, really cool. And, it, and, it, and it's one of the species that actually naturally sheds, does self, self pruning or self shedding of its branches. And so it, you end up with an architecture where it has a nice trunk and long branches and then these nice symmetrical tufts of the silvery branches at the end. So it has, kind of this candelabra appearance naturally. Um, but like other euphorbias, that, other of these coralliform euphorbias that have this self-shedding habit, this one is a little more challenging to propagate from cuttings, um, even though it looks a little bit like the, the pencil cactus that we're used to only being silvery and whatnot, it's, it's much harder to propagate. Um, so it's much harder to find in, in horticulture, but um, been doing experiments to try to find different kinds of cuttings that work better. It seems larger cuttings and some of the younger growth is often better. But, um, but this is a plant also that when people grow it, sometimes they get worried that if, because sometimes these branches turn yellow and fall off that their plant is unhealthy, but that's what it does naturally. It naturally prunes itself, basically. I love that because it's like a natural bonsai in the landscape. So it automatically gives you this kind of artistic nature of the landscape and does the work for you. Most definitely, yeah. It's... Are there any others here that you would like to show? There is one, another uh, version of the, uh, the Madagascan uh, Tiracali or Laro. Um, this is one that's got a bit of a different architecture. It kind of is more at right angles instead yeah. of the branches coming up. And this one also is much more cold sensitive. You can see um, actually on the ground here, oh, yeah. all these branches that, that shed from the cold damage. And, uh, and it's kind of interesting because normal Euphorbia tiracali is considered quite 
hardy to, to fairly cold temperatures, whereas some of these Madagascan ones, the reason they're probably much less widely grown is because they may be much less, much more cold sensitive, which is also, you know, maybe one hint that they're different enough that maybe we can call them a different species again someday. But, um, Propagating them, you just basically take these stem propagations, right? Like what you have in your hand could be a potential place for to propagate. Very much so, yeah. And these uh, the, the these chiricale types are, are are quite easy to propagate from even small cuttings often. And you just let them let the cutting dry out for a few days and then plant it in some well-drained mix and and you know water it periodically and. They, they tend to be good at rooting, because, uh, and as you can see, this, other than this cold shedding, how it keeps its all the, the branches all the way down, mm -hmm. it's it's one of the characteristics of these ones that are usually easier to root that they don't shed their branches, and it's interesting that theory holds for that Euphorbia analolavensis, the big green bush we saw earlier. That one is also very easy to propagate from cuttings, and it doesn't shed its branches naturally. In fact, we could only see the trunk because we'd pruned it a lot to, to see the otherwise. Before, a uh, year and a half ago, it was a giant green pyramid of branches, you know, with the long long branches at the bottom and, and short at, top, at the top, so it's... Amazing. Is this the, is this the extent of the coralliforms here? We've hit all the highlights, yeah. Well, this is amazing. Well, thank you so much for taking us through this and actually expanding our view behind uh, be, beyond the pencil stick cactus. <laughs> Into all the corals of the ocean. Indeed, or terra firma. <laughs> right. We hope you enjoyed the tour through Madagascar's unique coralliform euphorbs. Now, if you dug this episode, then go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And if you're keen on helping the channel out, hit that subscribe button and the notifications bell will prevent you from missing any episode. Tipping the channel or becoming one of our illustrious sustaining members is always appreciated, as it allows us to reinvest into more great episodes like this. Additionally, you could check out our online houseplant materials and courses, including the 125 Houseplant Care Spreadsheet, Houseplant Basics, Troubleshoot Your Houseplants, and the Houseplant Masterclass. And don't forget we have a new channel covering outdoor gardening, herbs, permaculture, agroforestry, and homesteading over at Flock Finger Lakes. We'll see you in the next episode.